Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to explore 10 assumptions of ordinary least squares method. Before understanding the assumptions, you should know how to derive the estimates of OLS method. For that, you can check my previous video, the link of which is given below. Now talking about the importance of the OLS method, we know that it is used to give us the unique estimates of parameters that gives us the minimum value of sum of square of residuals. Now in this particular video, we are going to focus on the assumptions of this method. Now the very first assumption is linear regression model. It means that the model should be linear in the parameters, though it may or may not be linear in the variables. But it is very important that the alpha and beta, which are the intercept and the slope coefficients, they must be linear in their form, while xi or yi can be nonlinear. The second assumption is x variables and error term are independent. So we know that the x variables or the regressors can be of two forms. The first is the case of fixed regressors and the second is the case of stochastic regressors. In both the cases, the xi and mu i, the covariance between them should be zero. The third assumption is zero mean value of disturbance mu i. So the mean value of the disturbance term is equal to zero given the value of xi, that is the expectation of mu i given xi is equal to zero. Or if x is non-stochastic, then we write it as the expectation of mu i is equal to zero. That is the mean of the random disturbance term is zero. Now let's look at this graph. The graph shows each y population corresponding to a given x is distributed around its mean value. So this circle is the mean value around which the values are distributed. Some values are above it and some are below it. These values are nothing but the mu i. The positive mu i cancel out the negative mu i values so that their average or mean effect on y is zero. The fourth assumption is no specification error or specification bias in the model. So the specification error basically means inclusion of unnecessary variables or exclusion of necessary variables or wrong functional form. So let's take an example and understand what does the inclusion and exclusion of variable means. So let's imagine that we are constructing a model to estimate the consumption expenditure. So for that case, if we are taking marks of a student as an independent variable, so do you really think that marks are really important in determining the consumption of a person? No. So it clearly means that we have included an unnecessary variable in the model. So this leads to specification error. Secondly, if again we are constructing a model on consumption expenditure and we are not including a very important variable that is the income of a person in the model. So do you think that the model will be right or the estimation will be correct? No, there will be some bias in the model. So it is very important to check the variables that we are taking in the model. Thirdly, wrong functional form. If we have written the wrong functional form of our model, then also we, it leads to the specification error. The fifth is homoscedasticity or constant variance of mu i. So the variance of the error or disturbance term should be same as per the fifth assumption, which is equal to sigma square, which is some constant. So it comes from the Greek verb skedinaim, which means to disperse or scatter. So in homoscedasticity, y population corresponding to various x values should have the same variance. Now let's look at these two figures. These show that as income increases, the average consumption also increases. In the second figure, you can see that the variance remains the same at all levels of income. Whereas in the first figure, the variance increases with the increase in income. It shows that richer families on the average consume more than poor families, but also there is more variability in the consumption expenditure of the rich. The variance in case of heteroscedasticity is written as sigma i square. The subscript i indicates that the variance is not constant. Now the sixth assumption says that there should be no autocorrelation between the disturbances. That is, the correlation between any two error terms is zero. So we write it as the covariance between mu i and mu j given xi and xj is equal to zero 
or if x is non stochastic then covariance between mu i and mu j is equal to 0 so the disturbances mu i and mu j are uncorrelated that is there is no serial correlation or no autocorrelation in the model so given xi the deviations of any two y values from their mean values should not exhibit any pattern so now let's look at these graphs so in figure a and b we can see certain patterns in figure a mu i's are positively correlated and figure b the mu i's are negatively correlated if the deviations follow systematic patterns then there is a presence of autocorrelation in the model now let's look at this figure c it shows that there is no systematic pattern to the mu i's thus it follows the assumption of zero correlation it should be noted that if the data are time series, the assumption of independence of deviation is difficult to maintain. I'll discuss how to bring autocorrelation into the analysis and with what consequences in my upcoming videos. The seventh assumption says that the number of observations n must be greater than the number of parameters k to be estimated. So it is very obvious to say that at least we should have two minimum observations to estimate the parameters. Now imagine that we had only the first pair of observations on y and x. So do you really think that from this single point we can get the values of two unknown parameters beta 1 and beta 2? So no, the answer is no. We cannot find out the values of beta 1 and beta 2 having only one pair of observations. So we need at least two pairs of observations to estimate the two unknowns. Now the eighth assumption says that all values of x must not be the same. That is the variance of x must be a positive number. Also there can be no outliers in the values of the x variable. That is values that are very large in relation to the rest of the observations. For example, we have the x values in the range of 1 to 100 and suddenly we have 2 to 3 values which are in thousands or maybe in lakhs. Then these values can dominate the whole result. So firstly, there should be variability in x or in short, the variables must vary. And secondly, outliers must not be there in the model. The ninth assumption says that there should be no multicollinearity in the model. Multicollinearity occurs when two or more independent variables are highly correlated with one another in a regression model. So the assumption of OLS states that there should be no such correlation among the independent variables. And now the last but not the least assumption says that the error terms should follow normal distribution. The graph for the normal distribution looks like this and not this. The second graph is the violation of this assumption. So it is very clear that from the figure how the normal distribution looks like. So this was all about the 10 assumptions of OLS method. So if you have any doubts, you can put them in the comment section below. Also, if you find the video useful, kindly hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I hope to bring more such videos in future. So thank you so much for watching.